<laughs> Welcome to the Skeleton Crew's Nightmare on Elm Street Apology Show. <laughs> That's right. It's been eight years and they're starting to second guess the retrospective where they shit all over my movies. <laughs> they're wondering if they made a little mistake. Well, they did, bitch. Don't fuck with my movies, fucker. Tonight, Freddy gets his revenge. <laughs> but before I do, here are your hosts. Jamie Sammons, Dave Z, and Alex Edwards. Get ready for another look at the movies that haunted your dreams since 1984. So put down that coffee and toss that bottle of Hypnosil. <laughs> and if you think you'll get out of this re-examination alive, you must be dreaming. Freddy, fuck out of here, bitch. We ain't apologizing for shit. Listen, we're just having a little fun here, going back, retreading our old retrospective, giving these movies another look. That's all. You ain't getting revenge on shit. But things are looking good for you, Fred. People have come around slightly on a few of your movies, but I don't see how Christian Craig or Zach Nelson are going to talk their way out of these three. They're going to attempt to turn us around on Nightmare on Elm Street Part 5, Dream Child, 6 Freddy's Dead, and 7 Wes Craven's New Nightmare. <laughs> Will they do that? I I don't know. We'll have to we'll have to wait and see, but uh, I can't imagine. But these two special guests have done an excellent job so far, so Let's just listen in and see. So here we are for part two of The Nightmare Continues. Skeleton Crew. Nightmare on Elm Street Revisited. Now let's talk about the ghoul. The ghoul. The ghoul inside your head. I mean the ghoul under your bed. I mean the... Wait, this isn't about Pat. Freddy. Yeah, Freddy. What up, bitches? This is the fucking ghoul, and you're listening to the fucking Skeleton Crew, son. Alright, these guys have one hell of a challenge ahead of them, so <laughs> so obviously they're here to give us a different view than, you know, we went pretty hard on all these movies, and they're here to show us that, no, nah, these are our favorite stuff, and here's why, and here's what you might have missed, and here's how you might have looked at it wrong, and all this good stuff, so we tackled part one, two, and four, that's why I said they're going to have one heck of a time trying to convince us that five, six, and New Nightmare are really good. Jamie already likes New Nightmare, but I don't know anyone really in the world who thinks five and six is good. So it'll be interesting to even hear your guys' thoughts on it. Like, are you even going to say, no, this is really good? Or are you going to be like, well, here's some good stuff. <laughs> so this will be good. <laughs> <laughs> so uh whoever wants to feel free to open this one up you know what i'll start off by saying i will i'm just gonna admit up front that five and six like most people i think are the weakest in the franchise right however compared to like my least favorite friday 13th or my least favorite halloween i could still tolerate nightmare five and six more than some of those others wow now i gotta know what friday do you think is worse than nightmare five or six 
Um, well, I hate uh, Jason Goes to Hell. Okay. And I hate Jason yep. X because I'm not a big sci-fi horror fan. Right. So it just wasn't for me at all. No, I get that. Okay. Okay. And then, and I can't stand Halloween Five with the Burning Passion. Wow, this guy <laughs> is really good. Thank you. Yeah, we should have had him on the show for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was speaking to you internally, listening to them. Good. Good. I'm glad we represented but, you. Yeah. In terms of uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 5, um, like we said before, I do like the fact that instead of just getting a bunch of new people, we are still following the same character, her and Dan. And one thing I love about – and for one thing, I think Dan is the best death of the movie. Oh, dude. And it's still – and it is considered pretty iconic. Oh, it's amazing. And so I think that – each movie, even the worst one, still has some sort of scene that is considered iconic or one of the best in a franchise, even if it is just for one scene. There's at least something there to look forward to. And one thing I love about when they do kill off characters, not only does it raise the stakes again by killing off Dan like they did with some of the other ones, but I also love that we still get a bit of him. Unlike some of the other ones where they just kill off someone in the first five minutes that came before mm. like i was keeping track and in the fourth one you still got to see joe and kate for a full 20 minutes before they were killed off and then Kristen died at the 40 minute mark so pretty much the halfway point mm. i counted well i didn't count like i saw the runtime right uh but with dan it was a half an hour into the movie when he was officially killed off so i do love the fact that even if there's a chance whether you really like him or not to feel like he's still a part of the story and well a seed literally is but <laughs> right that there's a chance for you to really care about him again or and we get to know him again and then he's killed off and for those who are fans of the franchise maybe are fans of the character it can be a gut punch oh yeah freddie turned from a father to a sperm donor <laughs> right <laughs> and so i do like some of the imagery in this movie too because i i think i i could tell they're going for a gothic horror vibe and so even if it's not as strong i still think it very much follows at least the continuity of what came before mm. and regardless of what you think about certain scenes and aspects i still have to give it credit where credit is due and trying to still continue developing characters and still trying to continue um the continuity because by number five in the franchise especially in the late 80s that's hard to come by Exactly. Let's not forget this movie wasn't even finished being written while they were shooting it. Like, I give it credit for that. Right. And for it to be maybe not a strong entry, but definitely not a complete shit show. Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Uh, it's it's tough. Like, I'm I'm thinking of like that the the kid. I hated that kid so much. I hated everything about him. His face. His acting, everything. I think that we we hated like uh, uh, Jacob or which which kid or the karmic Jacob. Jacob. Jacob yeah. Honestly, the last time when I went through it, I didn't realize he's not in the movie as much as people think he is. He's only in certain parts here and there. Maybe they just stood out to you. But in terms of his runtime, it's he's only in the movie for maybe six or seven minutes no, total. I think I'm thinking of it because I just watched. Yeah, I just watched that Nightmare documentary, so I, like, I'm, I'm just thinking of him because he was in a lot of that, I guess. No, but I guess, okay, so I think our problems, I'm not, I'm, I'm not great at memorizing. You guys took notes, so you let me know, but I thought our problems were, like, <clears throat> how is, how is, the kid has no consciousness of anything, no reference of anything, he can't dream a thing, um... The, why? Why does? Why do we have to go through the kids' dreams? Can't these motherfuckers just dream like they did in the first movie? What's happening right. here? How is the girl falling asleep on the diving board? How is this one falling asleep driving home? But I guess we said okay. You she could, fell asleep in the hot tub. She did. Yes. Oh, did she? Yeah, because she, woke, she up woke up in the hot tub. Is that what we missed? Yeah. Yes. So when, well, it's not hard to fall asleep in a hot tub. Oh, I got one. I've done it. When she fell asleep, she fell asleep in a hot in a hot tub, and her dream was about going on the diving board. Yeah, you did you say a hot dog? <laughs> yeah, so, hot tub. So, so hot tub. Was, is that, yes, she got she got into the jacuzzi, and then I think did she or she kind of ducked her head in, and then she did the whole waking up, but she really wasn't awake scenario. Yeah. and then when I she does officially wake up, she was still in the hot tub. Yes. 
hot I would have preferred she fall right. asleep on a hot dog, honestly. <laughs> no, that was part She's two. At the carnival. <laughs> yeah, that was part two. <laughs> that would have been yeah, the exploding two. hot dogs. Yeah, she yeah. falls asleep on one of them. <laughs> I will say, I think how I took it for you know with with the with the baby, the unborn baby, and I don't know. I mean, I don't know how true. I mean, I imagine unborn babies dream. I think that that has been a thing talked about. But I think that, you know, at the time of when, you know, when he was created at conception, he probably already has a soul. And so I think Freddy, Freddy is Uh a soul also, right? He's an evil spirit. Hmm. So that's how he was able to connect with Jacob. And the movie is, it follows the same as the, as dream or dream master is that he has to go through other people's dreams to get to new kills he couldn't go through Alice anymore because she defeated him the first time because she's the quote unquote dream master. Right. But didn't I say that she didn't defeat him? Like she didn't do anything in part four, right? That would qualify as defeating Freddy. The mirror. Evil so see mirror. itself and it will die. She didn't do anything. He just saw himself in a mirror. <laughs> well, well, she, she, got, mirror. she huh? did it. She did it. <laughs> she's what it did it. And she said, well, she said she closed the door, locked the door on him. Mirrors don't I, I mean, kill people. I don't know people. what that symbolized, but just... <laughs> but he's not a person anymore. So. Mirrors don't kill people. <laughs> yeah. People kill people. Alice see? showed him uh-huh. the hold up the Well, I think Alice <laughs> is just strong enough that he just yes. needed another way. Exactly. Yeah, he needed and, another way. And using the onboard baby just makes Alice vulnerable again. And they kind of well, state that earlier in the film about why she wasn't in control anymore. And the, but I also like the, the, aspect... the topic was abortion there too. That was what was interesting. Yes, absolutely. It was topical. Mm-hmm. We we did mention that, right? I remember us talking about that. It was kind of one thing about it. Yeah, there was. Yeah, it's so topical. Teenage pregnancy, abortion, drunk driving, eating disorders. Yes. and they even brought the dad back practice. to say he was going to AA meetings and he was getting better. So even such a side character is getting some development. Yeah, I love that too. I love her, and I like the callback to part four with mentioning Rick. You know, to have a a, a hope it's a boy because there's another. You know, having another boy in the house. I don't. I like the callback. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unlike other franchises, this one does give a chance for characters to mourn the death of their friends and loved ones. We don't really get to see that. Unlike Scream. Oh, Scream! They don't give a fuck. Well, they don't even mention the freaking the girl from part one again, barely. Like, um, Tatum's ashes are in Dewey's Tatum. trailer, okay? Poor <laughs> in Friday movies, they don't even know anyone's dead till the end of the movie. That's true. <laughs> and then they're they make their appearance. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I love the fact that they did bring in the baby dreaming thing, and that allowed him to get in. But also, what I really like about that is that it allowed things to happen when Alice was awake. And mm-hmm. so it kept her guessing because she's like, how is this happening? I'm not even asleep. Like, what the hell is going on? And I thought that was very clever. It is not the True. concept of this film that I have ever had an issue with. I think it's a brilliant concept. I, uh, and this time around watching it, I even thought Jacob was kind of cute. Like, I used to think he was like, <laughs> he reminded me of Isaac from Children of the Corn. But yeah. now, yes. uh, I was like, you know, he's actually kind of cute. He's not as weird looking as I remembered. But <laughs> the the other thing I noticed, too, and I want to say, Christian, you mentioned this um, about the gothic feel, yeah. is that... This film is fucking gorgeous. And mm. I never paid attention to that before because this was always a throwaway nightmare movie. When I was watching it this time, the lighting, the shots, the framing, it's beautiful. It's like stitches. And she I was just gonna say that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Holy shit. And I was gonna she, say, is it as beautiful as stitches? <laughs> and I also oh. told Brian, I was like, I finally understand. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, I finally get <laughs> Rachel Talele. Talele! Not only did she direct the film, but it was her story I idea. I I get what... Oh, wait a minute. Or was that the... No, she directed uh, the next one. She but directed was, six, right? So, okay, okay. So, yeah. I was going to say, I knew she wasn't that good. Okay, so that's... <laughs> Ah. Those comments will come up in the next one. But I did notice that this is a really good looking movie. And um, there was like the whole Super Freddy thing, the comic book thing. I don't love the Super Freddy. 
I but, like the comic book stuff. But it the comic it's, book stuff is great. And I it, mean. you know, um, even though it looks like an aha video. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. It's hey. <laughs> but the late 80s. What do you want? Yeah. It's really Pretty. well done. But seriously, the next time anybody out there watches this this movie, pay attention to the colors and the lighting and the framing of the shots and the shadows. They did such beautiful things with shadows. Like they really fucking tried to make a good looking movie. And even though it does have its faults, that is not one of them. Like it, it looks good. And I was really impressed with that because I just never gave it any credit for anything prior. <laughs> and uh, I was like, you know what? God damn, this is a really skillfully made film as far as, you know, technically, and uh, also, yeah, like I said, I like the concept. I like the fact that he, you know, gets to her through her unborn baby. And it just, I don't know. I, it's There are a lot of things that I don't love. But when I was watching it this time, I was just like, it, it's not bad. And Brian is just like, you're high. <laughs> yeah, like, tell the truth. Were you high? Because these guys don't even like it that much. <laughs> they're like wow really? I, know, I see what you're getting at uh especially yeah. in ter- especially in terms of it's it is a very stunning movie mm-hmm. and at the same time at least once again tries to stay away from being super formulaic by trying to change up the concept a bit but with characters we've grown to know yes. and it gives at least some sort of explanation for why it seems like someone is dreaming when they're actually awake Right. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of hard to find and a reason was, why that could be happening. Yeah, and that was fresh to the series. We had never had anything like that before, as far as um, you know, a, 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 an unconventional way for Freddy to get in. And uh, yeah, I uh, I actually <laughs> I actually like that. Now, um, I I don't know what was going on with me when I watched this series this time. It is uh, I have a totally different perspective on every one of them. Wow. And were you high was, this time and sober last time? Um <laughs> that'll do it. I it's everything better. I uh I don't remember if I was sober the last time or not. I actually was okay. high this time. Man, that helps. Okay. Uh, but there you helps. Go. <laughs> and helps. you know what's funny oh, is is <laughs> I um purposely though I didn't until we were about to get to the comic book section. And then I hit it, and Brian's like, uh, and he was like, "What are you?" Doing? And I was like, "This is the perfect time, right now, right now, do this right now." <laughs> and then uh, I did it again in the next movie when, um, when he was going into like laying on the couch smoking a joint, and I was just like, "Hit it now, hit it now, of course." <laughs> and it completely opened up my perspective of the film. And he's sitting there going, "You know what? This is the way to watch these movies." <laughs> yeah, no question. But it's, but, and I don't want to say that I was skewed in a bet, you know, like that, that what I think about them now isn't accurate. And I was just, you know, not there. No, I really think that what it did was cause me to focus on it more. And when I focused on it, that's when I really noticed the, well, the cinematography and, and things like that, that really hadn't stuck out to me before. But this time I was zeroed in and I'm like, God damn, this is this is not as bad as I always thought it was. Like, not even close. Huh. So, mm. And that was the first half of the movie was sober. So, like, <laughs> like I, wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't that way through the whole thing. I just enhanced the bits that I thought would be enhanced by that. You know, the visuals. And, uh, mm. and that really did. That really did. And I don't know. Wow. I, I uh, yeah, I don't hate this one. Well, I'm I'm gonna watch them with a buzz now. I think. Uh, it, 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 well, I think I may have said something kind of similar the first time around. I mean, these guys they've been listening, so maybe I remember saying that I did like the look of it, and that it was dark, and they had that gothic look. I don't think I went as deep into it, you know, as as Jamie did with the descriptors, but I I, I do remember appreciating that and th- that they tried that. My issue was that having a goth look, look and all that and, and, and the presentation being what it is, for me, doesn't mix with having that over-the-top comedy that we have with, with Freddie every time he talks. It was just 
that much it was very distracting it, it was like just it was just way too much and it i know people say that about the sixth one but my attitude about the sixth one's a little different i'm not saying actually i will say it i like this is my least favorite in the franchise oh yeah i think everybody's i think six even has some value to it iconic imagery and or just looney tune like let's okay let's see it then but this this is just true I mean, I don't even think it knows what it's trying to be because it, it's, it's not even a finished film while it's being made. And the guy literally said he was just coming up with things on the spot. Like, isn't the one where he said there's not even an ending, so he started doing the upside down staircases? Oh my god, I love that sequence. Me? That was, that was really fucking cool. Yes, Nightmare Up Street meets Labyrinth. Come on. What about yeah. the guy fighting with himself? Didn't didn't something happen? They ran out of. Something that or they have no money. Four. That was in part four. That was that's that what was I'm four. saying. That's why I thought part four was the one. They ran out. Of it money. was no. Yeah, I know they ran out of money, but I also remember him saying that it, it was written as they went or something like that. Yeah, but, it was the during the writer's strike. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. The writer's strike was yeah. happening during four. So maybe both of these, maybe four and five. But, had but different... five was rushed, and that's why that wasn't finished. It was rushed. Okay, right. That's the problem yeah. with a lot of the, these that. films is that they were rushed when they probably yes. really didn't need to. But um... yeah, we'll never understand that, right? Like, what's with the rush? Yeah. Well, and that is that well, is present throughout the entire series, in. really, because it starts with eighty four. The next one's in eighty five. Then the yeah. only. Then it's they skip eighty six, but then it's eighty seven, eighty eight, eighty nine, right. ninety yeah, one, ninety three. Like they, well, they cranked them out. They were following the formula that Friday the Thirteenth did because they gotta they gotta strike while the iron's hot. They have to, you know, the producers at New Line are like, okay, we gotta crank one out of these every year. They were doing what right. the Friday the Thirteenth did in the early and days. And Scream the did the same did. thing, right? Yeah. So that's yeah. why they were the they good, were setting so. dates ahead. <laughs> No, it is. They were <laughs> they were probably having okay. This is when this has to come out, and they were doing it backwards. In other words, okay, this movie we need this to come out um, in the middle of July, summer block, whatever it is, and then they're going to take that date, and then they got to start working backwards from them and say, okay, we got to get all this done by right. then. Then they get closer and closer, just like when they try to make that ET video game for Atari, and what happened there? <laughs> right? Okay, we only have six weeks left. Boom, we got to get this out for holiday season. Do the best you can. That's how yeah. these people think. These freaking heads of companies—they don't look at it. They don't it's understand art. the big picture, <laughs> right? Yes, yeah. right. They don't care about the art. It's not about that. It's about the bottom line. Yeah. So uh, I, when you, yeah, but I don't see why you couldn't write it for two months and then do it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I agree. But you know, I, one thing yeah. I don't get about this movie, and and it's a small thing. It is. It's not. And I admit that, but it still bothers me is the whole finding or, you know, when she discovers the uh, Amanda Kruger bit and, uh, and she's like, you have to, you have to free my spirit or, you know, find my bones or whatever. Well, then what the fuck was she doing in the cemetery? Now I know that they had an empty grave for her and that's even said in this movie, but why would the ghost go to that grave if her body's not there? And that does not make any sense to me. And it's like, Oh, good. No, I'm, that's it. I don't get it. <laughs> I, I guess I guess the only way what I could rationalize on that one is that she because in the beginning she was in part three she was following Neil Gordon. So I think she was just when he was there at the funeral she was she followed him there. That's I guess that's the only thing I could think of. As, that's as what Brian. That's that. what Brian said too. He told me now, and he hates this movie, but he told me I was being picky with that, and I'm like, and I, I yeah, I, I am. So. But I, I wanted I to never share thought something of that one. about the Amanda Kruger thing. Somebody put this on the exploding heads on YouTube, and uh, and I want to. It was a comment, and somebody comes in and says, because you know, I, we, I just you know, I complained there too, of course, but they said. I thought the Amanda Kruger thing in part five was her soul stuck in torment because of the Catholic beliefs in regard to suicide and the afterlife. So it makes mm-hmm. sense that her soul would be stuck in the place where she was most connected to. And then, mm-hmm. which I thought, then I said, never thought about that, but I like it. And then listen to this. I, I just saw this part now. Beatrice, somebody weighed in, and this is what she says. You tell them. As the actor that played Amanda Kruger in NOES 5, I concur. So this is the one that played her. She says, 
technically she didn't want the sin of committing suicide. So she sealed herself up in the tower, but then dying there without a proper funeral and without her remains consecrated, she was forever trapped in the in-between world of her earthly prison until a living being, Yvonne, found her remains and touched it with her living soul. I go back to the full story, full story in my book, The Kruger Curse, Nightmare Before Elm wow. Street. Weird, huh? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That so, makes sense. Okay, you know what? This movie's amazing. All right, let's go to part six. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, it, it uh, what was I going to say? Oh, walling herself up and starving herself to death, would that not still be considered suicide? She she created a circumstance in which she would not survive. I don't know if that's suicide. That sounds I, like suicide. Just, it sounds just like suicide, suicide the long game. <laughs> it's like I didn't lay down on that train tracks to just kill. That just created a circumstance <laughs> that I wouldn't survive. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm trying here. I don't know. <laughs> Even I can't defend that one. But yeah, she says a lot. This person. I mean, she. I'm not going to get into it all. It's just <laughs> read. But she does say a lot about this whole thing. And she's like, she lived for many years after having Freddie. But after he was arrested and accused of the murders, she couldn't deal with what her son had become. So she sealed herself away in the room in the attic of the asylum as penance and as a way to end her life without technically committing suicide. So that's what she's saying, and that's how she's interpreting it. But, Jamie, you're saying ultimately that's, that's what is she – not technically committing suicide. Yeah, maybe she just forgot to install the doorknob or something. Yeah. You yeah. don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Sorry, God. That was an accident. <laughs> Oops. I knew I should have went through all the boxes. What I do like, I think it was covered a little bit, is about Dan's death particularly is, is obviously they survived together in the, in the fourth one, and they're in love, and obviously – there's a great loss with that because you know alice loved him dearly and so of course that was important but also the fact of how cruel is that that freddie off the father of of an unborn baby you know i don't know i think that was a pretty like pretty cruel you know thing to include in the in the movie but it's great i mean i think that also shows that freddie doesn't give a fuck and that was the first death of you know it's first death of the movie and i also like that they brought, you know, he pretended to be Dan at, at, towards the end to try to confuse everybody, which it only lasted a few seconds. But, but yeah, I, I think I, I felt that loss, like when he, you know, when certain characters die. So I mean, I, I I liked, like Christian said too, that he was in it at least for a little while before before ending it. But just the fact that, and I, I do, I don't know, I don't see Freddie as much of a jokester in this one compared to the fourth one. I mean, he was still kind of ridiculous and pumpkin faced <laughs> but um <laughs> i felt like they kind of kept him more in the shadows more and i think there was more intent to try to make him a little bit scarier by not including him as much i don't I, you know i'm not sure if it worked as well but i don't find him as he's not jaws freddy in this one either so, i don't know that's my <laughs> yeah, thought and i think that's because characters are going through like we said um should she even have this baby suffering the loss of her long-term boyfriend. There's just so many other things happening at the same time that mm-hmm. the Freddy elements have been sporadically over the course of the movie that I yeah. still see, yes, it's not an equal balance between scares and comical Freddy, but I still don't think it's complete 180 from what came before. I think it's once again, at least on a similar level, if not just one notch above the movie that came before. So I think even with Comical Freddy, there has never been um, a time when Freddy went from completely scary to complete goofball. I feel like they've just been slowly escalating over the course of the franchise. Mm. And that I yeah, I totally agree with that. It has been a progression. But another thing I love about this is the, that Dan's parents come in. And this is this is not. Oh, yeah. It's, it's not important to the Freddy plot at all. But it's a nice character moment when Dan's parents show up and they're like, you know, we want to, you know, take the baby. And she's like, no, no one's taking this baby. It's mine. And then they have the nerve to say, we have the right. It's our grandson or grandchild. And um, and I'm like, well, she's the fucking mother. What are you talking about? Yeah. And they said they were going to like take her to court and all this. Yes. And I'm like, well, okay, you would fucking lose. But uh, it's typical. 
the well, Supreme I, I do like do. that character moment. Yeah, and it's it kind yeah. of harkens back to the first one that I talked about, where it's like Nancy has all of these different relationships, relationships. and all these things mm-hmm. going on. Yeah, and it's the same thing because not only is Alice having to deal with the loss of her her boyfriend and now her baby daddy, but also she has to fight Freddie and also maybe deal with his fucking annoying parents and you know and at the same time trying to figure out why the hell is Freddie back. I don't know. Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot going on at one time. Yeah, yeah. I, if you could I, remove the comedy, me... it would be good. This is oh, see yeah. for me now. My recollection is this. Now I don't watch this as much as you guys, and it's been a minute. But I'll say this: my recollection is that everything that comes out of Freddie's mouth in this particular movie is a joke. There's not one serious line delivered. I could be wrong. Like I said, this is just my recollection. I'm pretty sure that this this was that movie where everything like he would be featured for a few minutes for the kill. He would come in and everything out of his mouth is a ha ha, not a wink at the audience, and it's over the top. And that's really to its detriment. And I think that if you take this movie with the topics we've discussed and the look and everything else, and it's a better movie that's done more serious. I can even excuse the fact that it's a baby, an unborn baby that's able to do these dreams because – I mean, it is a movie, and who's to say that, uh, you know, if a baby is in inside of you and you have a growing baby in you, that part of your brain isn't somehow feeding that baby somehow through 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 the uh, umbilical cord or what have you? I don't know enough about scientifically mm-hmm. to say, but for the sake of a movie, I guess it's it's okay to say that this baby is dreaming. Based on the knowledge of the mother, it's pulling you know, you know, synapses from her brain somehow. So well, he also I could is a blank that. slate. So Freddie yeah. is able to construct whatever he wants without the baby's dreams and being involved, like without them fighting against him. Yeah, I almost don't. I still think it's my least favorite, but I, I feel like I don't don't hate it as much and kind of want to watch it again. Yay! You know, the other thing too that Jamie was talking about how well shot it was. I loved all the dreams in the, in the asylum and like, you know, the, like the swinging lamps and the long hallways. I I just thought that was just a, those were beautiful shots, especially in the part where Alice falls asleep. And it kind of reminded me of part three with Kristen when she wakes up from her bed and then looks out and then it's her, the Elm street house or whatever. It reminded me of that too, where she's just sleeping. And then all of a sudden it's her wall, it's dark. And then all of a sudden it lights up and it's the, the, Asylum. I just thought that was a really cool shot. Mm-hmm. You know what I thought was funny though is when I was watching that and the dream where she is she is Amanda in the yes. asylum. <laughs> when it first starts, you just see the nun walking for you know towards you, and I my assumption was like oh this this is Amanda, but then she stops, and I think it's right after you see Robert England kind of leer into frame. Um, she stops and looks at her name tag. And I was like, "Why the fuck? Why? Why is she looking at her name tag? Doesn't she know her own name?" And then I and then I looked at her face, and I was like, "Oh shit, no, that's Alice." <laughs> but it was so funny because I was like, "What? What are you doing? Who like, who, like, why aren't you calling to the people who are locking the door? Why are you stopping to look at your name tag? Get the hell!" out of here but then i realized oh that's yeah okay <laughs> i was just being done there's a hundred let's go <laughs> wow uh, uh this is not the segment i thought we were getting <laughs> is is jamie convincing you guys this is should be higher in your list or <laughs> <laughs> Look, but that's I'm how sorry, strong guys. i think this franchise is as a whole that even one of the weaker entries i'm still able to find you know, things that Something. I think are enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. My, and I do still have some nitpicks. Like, you're going to tell me Alice knew the phone number to the pool off the top of her head, you know, when she called Dan at the pool and from the diner. And I'm like, what? How, how, you just know that number? Like, how often do you call the pool? <laughs> but <laughs> whatever. I don't know. Those are the I do numbers that's... to weird shit all the time, too. And I would always call, you know, bug my friends at their work and stuff. I don't know. <laughs> That's I'm my argument. Like, yeah, uh, I mean, maybe there's a it, phone book below camera. It yeah. Makes <laughs> or she was having an affair with the pool boy. And that's not actually Dan's kid. It may be. Yeah, it may <laughs> Or with Yvonne. I mean, she did give me lesbian vibes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and Alex, I'm not, uh, I didn't expect this either. Yeah. 100%. I did not expect it. But I am not above admitting that 
my opinion has changed. And I am honestly, it always makes me happy when yeah. I can enjoy something more than I always thought I did. Mm. And to me, that's just, uh, that's a win, you know, and uh, I'm actually very, very excited. That's why I was so excited about doing this show. I kept telling you how excited I was. Mm -hmm. That's why. Um, that and Zach and Christian being here, um, uh -huh. who I just think or that was the perfect combination. I'm so excited. Uh, but this whole thing has just made me really excited. And then once I watched the movies again, I was like, damn. You know, I I am glad that we are reevaluating all of this. Yeah, I'm going to have to watch with my wife because I, I don't think she knows my feelings at all for like anything. Beyond, I think she just knows I like part two, but I don't think she knows anything I think about the rest. So maybe I'll just act like they're normal movies that I have no opinion on. And I'll say, yeah, you know, we never really got into the Freddy stuff and then uh, give it a revisit myself. It sounds like it's in need of one. Well, and you may not come to the same conclusions, but I just noticed that when I was really, really, you know, looking, really trying, really giving it my complete attention, that it would, the series is much better constructed than I ever gave it credit for in the past. Yeah. And kudos to the filmmakers for the studios and the producers wanting them to make a movie come so quickly. They would have gotten paid the same amount regardless of what kind of trash they could have made but the fact that they at least were still attempting to continue continuity still attempting to give character growth still attempting to talk about interesting topics like having the baby versus not having the baby and getting custody of a kid like those are things that are definitely not needed in a slasher movie but the fact that they are still trying to do that with the movie they're just trying to crank out uh, it speaks a lot on the effort yeah absolutely yeah i think the idea they were pushing was that pro-choice is a good thing if like the son of freddy i mean this son of freddy the son of uh <laughs> wait what am i saying i don't know <laughs> i don't know what you're saying because she had the baby <laughs> uh oh if it was gonna be oh no wait didn't freddy want to take it though or something like that i forgot wasn't there something to that like freddy didn't he want to like raise him as his own or do something like that I honestly I don't remember the full. I think that's where it's a little muddled because I mean, it, yeah, because it kind of it to me. I always took it as maybe he would take over him, kind of like in part two, but I don't know, or raise him, yeah, or rape somehow, raise him, yeah, I don't know. Okay, but either way, okay, so it sounds like there's not. I mean, it sounds like everybody feels a little bit better about this movie than they did before tonight. Uh, so, what do you think, Dave? Well. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I feel like I want to watch it again and see maybe maybe I'm going to finally prefer it to six or something like that. The, the discussion just, you know, it leads me to want to see it again and, and check it out, maybe catch a buzz, too, because that, that's always going to help. But I don't know if I can get past the damn comedy so much. It's just so over the top. And it's just anytime a, a franchise changes, I have a hard time forgiving it. And that's what happens. I take it personal when I really, when I'm really into something and I'm loving where it's going, like a, a, a lot of the early movies in a franchise and the tone changes, it takes, it just, it just irks me. And it, it's going to take a lot for me to be able to cast that aside because I find it so unnecessary. I just want to see part one again or something like part one. And when I can't, it's just, okay, well, this is what it is. And all that comedy just turns me off so much because then everything started getting comical in the 80s. So I always blame Freddie. Oh, yeah, 86 was not a good year for comedy. Yeah. Well, yeah, we were in well this was 89, too. So. Yeah. Right. so it was still going on, yeah. In full yeah. But ever since three and four. Screaming bitch all the time. And I'm yeah. like, you know, okay, that was effective when you did it like once in a movie. But right. – if you do it three or four times, it's just not as effective. But this one holds true to what I said, is that in the later sequels, the Freddy is the part that I don't like. And it's the yeah. that's the part that drags it down for me. But the actual story and the character stuff, that's what I do like. And and, and this one, it particularly helps. the look of it. But Freddy is um, like, you know, him wearing the, chef, the chef's hat. And uh, oh, okay. bon appetit, bitch. Yeah. bitch. And even like the way everybody was acting at the table, like the mom making the outrageous faces and stuff, like it was just very like. Um, but I guess if it's a dream, but the best. It's a dream. 
Yeah, exactly. and then I'm also wondering who who just sits there while somebody is falling asleep to the point that they're having a nightmare at the dinner table, and they just right. sit there and do nothing. Like, yeah, what were they no doing sense. at the time? <laughs> yeah, I think my kid's on something. That's Self insane. Involved. Yeah. Yeah, that's nuts. She's looking like a garbage pail kid, and everyone's just standing around <laughs> looking at her. Well, I think the mom was more – this is, again, me getting deep, but maybe it's because I'm an English teacher. <laughs> but I feel like the mom just wanted to use the daughter for her own, you know, celebrity status yep. and getting all the attention. So I could see her not really paying yeah. attention to her daughter when she's at that table chatting with all of these big magazine people. But if she's the celebrity, though, how does nobody know what's happening to her? Well, because well, I'm sure the mom living... is trying to get all the attention. They're all staring yeah, at her. Yeah, she's living vicariously through her daughter. She yeah. is forcing her daughter to do all the things that she never got to do. And yeah. even though her, the even though Greta mom. doesn't, yeah, exactly. And even though Greta doesn't want to do this stuff, her mother wants her to because she never got to. And that is another mm -hmm. abusive relationship. I mean, honestly, yeah, break that shit down. You guys talked about it earlier. There's, you know, yeah. alcoholism. There's abuse. There is, you know, abortion. There is all, all of religion. All of these fucking yeah. things wrapped up in this film. And, and it all ties back away. to the parents, just like yes. the parents are the reason why Freddy's after them in the first place. Exactly. Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Well, oh, this is crazy. It, See, I made a list. I made a list about, I don't know, a couple of years ago, and it was, it was it was for Exploding Heads. We we ranked the top, the big three in order, Halloween, Friday the 13th, Nightmare on Elm Street, every movie, though. And at the time, there was 32 movies. Now there's 33, I want to say, with – yeah, I think this was before Halloween ends. So at the time, my number 30 out of 32 – was nightmare five i gave it a two and a half out of ten all right and the only two movies i liked less than that were jason goes to hell and halloween resurrection that was the bottom three so yeah i don't know if i'm ready to go higher but i, I but i definitely like i said i want to watch it again wow, we should steal an idea for this show i didn't think about that it's a lot of fun <laughs> yeah because we don't know mine or jamie's <laughs> let's do it Shoot, why not yeah totally steal it uh, all right, so <laughs> so uh, I don't care. I'm in on both. Yeah, you're on the same show. Um, yeah. So yeah, well, I guess I guess we it's all summed up here. I don't think we need a real specific. Oh, I guess I didn't say none. Um, yeah, um, I don't know. I, I'm I think I'm in Dave's camp in the sense that I'm not gonna make any announcements until I see this again. It definitely makes me want to watch it and just be more open and just go with the flow and don't question things. And now I know the girls on the hot tub and all that. So yeah, I think it's, uh, it'll be more digestible at this point. And believe me, I want to like these movies. It's not like I had a great time trashing. Them. I mean, when we laughed, I, I had a great time, but like not, I don't want to like hate, hate, hate. So um, I would love to love five Freddy movies out of the eight or whatever there is. So, like, that'd be great. Or nine, I guess, for Freddy vs. Jason. Yeah, I'll give another watch. I'm not going to say anything now, but I will say that you definitely, um, or J Jamie, too, especially, uh, really made me think twice and uh, consider some things. And uh, that's as far as I can go with this. <laughs> you know... <laughs> When I watched it the last time for Exploding Heads, I intentionally waited until I bought my new house because I wanted it to be the first thing I did when because I wanted to be in the happiest headspace I could possibly be after having three years of turmoil. Well, that was a nightmare with the squatters and everything. Yeah, everything. And and I had you know court with this and court with that. I had all this stuff. Everything is finally settled. We got our house. And I I told the guy. I, I told Christian and Brandon. I said when we get in the house, when I get in my house. I'm going to be in a good frame of mind, the best frame of mind I've been in in years, and I want to watch the New York Street franchise now because I'm not going to be thinking negative about anything, and I'm just going to watch it and try to pull positives out of it. Out of it. And I still gave this movie a two and a half out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. I did try. Um, but just so you yeah, know, two I, and a half just, out of ten. Yep, two and a half Ooh, out of ten. Damn. Oh my yeah, god! Yeah, out of ten. <laughs> Well, that's how but I said, because this is, yeah, two and a half out of ten for that. Jason goes to hell in, in Halloween Resurrection. <laughs> well, I can understand those two. Dude, out of 32 movies, I only rated 20, uh, 24 of them, pardon me, 
25 movies out of 32, I gave a 5 or higher out of 10. So it wasn't like I was trashing anything, mm-hmm. really. They were, they were fair ratings, you know what I mean? Like, as far as this franchise is concerned, Nightmare 2, New Nightmare, and the remake all have the same rating for me out of 10. Wow. So, good. yeah, six good. and a half. That's what I gave them all last time I watched them. So, wow. There you- but this is a two out of half, two and a half. So. Boy, where, where, where was this, Dave and Jamie, when we were doing the Nightmare Retro in 2015? I would have loved you guys. <laughs> well, because that Jamie had eight years less. Uh, <laughs> and I honestly, at the time, because the way we approached retrospectives back then was very different. We weren't serious. Like, we, we didn't take it seriously. We fucked around a lot and called out things that, are there but don't necessarily bother me when I'm really watching it but we pointed everything out when we did retrospectives because that's what we were doing we were just bringing everything to the surface this is the fuck around show if you haven't noticed everybody <laughs> yeah fuck I mean so find out. <laughs> so I mean and our attitudes were very different and oh yeah I was young I was like 35 oh yeah it's great I was 40 you still are I still am. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, he says he's been watching Nightmare One for forty years. So from his first week of birth, he's been watching it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I had to was be, what like twenty three. <laughs> what? You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With twenty three cats. Mm-hmm. Well, I was <laughs> negative fifteen when the first one came out. So wow. <laughs> wow. I was two. <laughs> Word. Damn. And I, I think too, like what I think what Dave struggles with, or you know, I mean, and I can see that the 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 transition of Freddie becoming a comedian. You know, I was born in '82, so I mean, I wasn't two years old watching Nightmare Now, or at least thinking about it. So by the time I was really thinking about it, like '87, he was already kind of there. So I mean, I was able to to watch the first two movies and enjoy the other ones. Now I could see. Dave, when he watched the, you know, Nightmare 2 on the, vi- you know, getting the two videos at yeah. the, like, the Rite Aid or whatever at the yes, time. Yes, that was it. I remember that. And, uh, you know, I could see where, why you would have more more issues with that because you were really there every step of the way, all the way mm-hmm. up, you know, so. Yeah. No, it's different being there because you're there and you have expectations like once once something's already done and it's been done for 15 years and you're just going to go see what it was all about i think it's a different like it's definitely a different perspective compared to i'm here this is my thing i'm living it it's my moment and ooh well you're changing it what are you doing i like the first three or whatever like, you know yeah Make- yeah it's different uh when it's already in the can it's it's kind of like well i guess that's what they did yeah. Let's get to Freddy's Dead. Um, so that chick, Talalay, she uh, has been working on these movies all this time, and she finally wanted to step up and direct. And I, I forgot kind of whose choice it was, maybe her or a couple guys and her or whatever. And they all said, well, let's just go all out Looney Tunes, which is strange i mean you didn't have to do that like this could have been like the one that returns freddy to darkness it's freddy's dead it's dead which is what new nightmare is for well yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> i guess so <laughs> they did that and then this one just went all out like they did literally he was wily e. coyote in one moment with the spikes and you got the power glove and graphics and you got the kid jumping up and down on the blocks and ugh, jumping up and down in real life. and <laughs> But then you got the cool Carlos scene, which was pretty traumatizing. You got that creepy <clears throat> molestation scene with uh, that girl. No sugar for daddy. Yeah, that was fucking yeah. weird. <laughs> um, then you got, like, the Lisa Zane um being the the big spin of the movie was that she's the daughter, not the boy you've been following the entire movie since uh, the Wizard of Oz moment. Oh my god. And I like Wizard of Oz. <laughs> yeah, but not in my Freddy movie. Yeah, no. <laughs> and Freddy turning <laughs> yeah. into a witch and all this oh, crap. Boy. Like, it is just bonkers. Um, I don't know. What else? Uh, I guess they had that weird... Oh, the 3D glasses and... Ugh. 
but it has moments. Like, we even said, I think we gave credit to, like, I remember Matt Wiesel was on that episode, and he was, like, a nostalgic fan of that movie. And then, so I like the part where the map opens up, they keep driving in the same place. I love a movie when they do that, and uh, it's yeah. one of my favorite tropes, and it's right up there with microfiche. Yeah, yeah, microfiche. Uh, which, by the yeah. way, I was so excited <laughs> about in the new Insidious, but the <laughs> the um, but whenever you have a, a, like an inescapable horror and you're just driving around and you can't get out, uh, like Legacy or Burnt Offerings, I love that because it drives it home that you're not getting out of this, you know. And I thought that was, I think that's a fun sequence. Oh, it is. Mm -hmm. It reminds me, it reminds me of dreams that I have where I can't get out of situations or, you know, no matter how hard you're trying to get to something and you can never get there. Oh, I have that all the time. It's a nightmare. I I know. I hate that. Yeah, (laughs) it is a nightmare. (laughs) Like literally, you just, you just like, for me, it's, um, I'm working a lot of the times, but I, but nothing, I can't like do anything. Like nothing gets accomplished. And you just keep doing something or keep looking for something or whatever the case, and it just never changes. And this goes on. It feels like it goes on for like an hour in, in your mind. It's horrible. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, so this one that it has it has a great stuff like, well, it would have been great. Uh, weird dialogue from the teacher being in the class with no kids. Then you got, like, the great amusement park with no kids until you get to Roseanne and oh, Tom Arnold. So, like, it's it almost like they keep having almost good ideas and keep fucking it up every time. So, it it's very strange that way. But, uh, yeah, so I'm definitely curious on to your guys' opinions on this movie. Well, personally, this is my least favorite of the franchise. However, I could still say that I'm not bored when I watch it. Yeah. Because there are so many ridiculous scenes in there. That's it's like one of those like you have to see this movie to believe it exists. <laughs> and because I remember one of my friends literally was like, "This movie is an acid trip," but we had a great time. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. It's one of those things where you laugh at it, and this one's meant to be a joke. And at least you're in on the fact that it's a joke. And there are so many cameos. It is fun to see you know Johnny Depp again in a very brief moment to see Alice Cooper, right? Um, yeah, and they're Roseanne and Tom Arnold, and you know Roseanne was at the top of the shows at the time. Yeah, that was before and, she lost her shit. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> was this around the time she sang the national anthem? <laughs> so I don't know. There's just so many ideas in there, and there, and in, once again, the continuity I don't think completely changes either. Because it's supposed to take place a few years into the future. Ten, there, year, no one said, ten years think, from then, so it would have been 2001. Something I love like the that. aspect of it. Yeah, because if you're going to bridge away from Alice and all that, then at least say that there's some sort of time jump where she could have moved on and did other things. And you could, you could assume what happened to her with the time yeah. jump like that. And so a lot of those aspects. And we get to a little bit know even more about Freddie. And it's not like we were told he never had a kid before. So it's nice to get a little bit more backstory of him before his demise in this version of the character. And so I don't know. I just think even for it being the worst film in a franchise, I'm still not hating on it or feel like I'm suffering when I'm watching it. <laughs> yeah, I would I would echo a lot of that too i mean it's it's not yeah it's probably on the lower end of mine you know and but at the same time it's for for what i was watching at the time and still now it's still in this in the spirit of the freddy movies that i liked or that i was growing up with more was the more a little bit more of the jokey ones and i remember really or watching it at the time thinking that it was the last film and so I remember it was always it was bittersweet to watch it. And maybe in some ways that that made me a little upset because it was ending. And so, you know, so I don't I had a different feelings about it then, too, about maybe it not being my most favorite. But I I like that in the Never Sleep Again, they mentioned it was kind of like a Mr. Toad's wild ride. Uh, with going into his brain and so i liked i liked all the callbacks to you know finally we're getting we're getting past the whole gang rape of a nun and why he was created but we get to 
get more into what he was like as a child and then as a teenager with Alice Cooper as his, as his foster dad and, and cutting himself and, you know, and killing the mouse in the class and then going into um, ha- getting himself, putting himself together for a minute there and having a wife and then a child. And so I, I liked all of that. And I like, I, I like that they kind of opened up the opportunity that he used different gloves even I love that was, scene where you see them all and there's that one yes. that looks like a bear claw like that. Yes. That's very cool. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah. And that would have been nice mm-hmm. to if they fleshed that out more. No pun intended. Yeah, but, I, um, I, I agree. Yeah, but it, I just I, I liked all the, the stories. and I liked that it was it was trying to be a whodunit or like a mystery the whole time on like who who is this child, which is funny because if it was John, John is way younger than the time. Well, the yeah, of time I mean, killing, it, you know? they actually say in the film that it was 1966 when they took his child away from him. Right. And this is supposed to be 2001. Yes. Uh, uh, how in the hell could he for one second think he was Freddie's son? Like that makes no sense at all. But exactly. he also had amnesia and maybe he didn't know how old he was. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. That's, and he was probably played by someone who's in the 30s anyway. So exactly. that's true. <laughs> and we never learn who he was ever, you know, right. in this whole yeah. movie, you know. And so I liked all of that. I liked going back into Elm Street and now it's like fucking Twin Peaks and um, Which was big at the time. So Right, which and is very even, big. And they even call it. it. Yeah. They even reference it. And yeah, going into the school and like just how fucking crazy all the parents were, you know, because he, basically because Freddie killed all the kids, you know, he he got to them all. So I I think I liked the the story overall. I you know, and the kids you know, it, it continues to to go down the same path as as the previous movies. There's kids with issues, and you know, we get more topical stuff. You know, we get abusive, a mentally unstable mother who likes to deafen her child, a creepy molester dad, and you know, the dominant be like me father, and I, you know, and and even on the hokey stuff, I I liked the now I'm playing with power, and you know, it's all for the audience. It's just it's. It's total like fan food. I get kid food. I don't know, but I, overall, I you know, I it's not as bad of a, a movie as I originally thought. But it's, I mean, it's still lower on my end. But I there's still a lot that's really good about it, and you know, I would still, I'll still, or at least it. fun to watch. Fun to watch. Yeah, it's a it's a fun ride for sure. Well, I um. What I appreciate, and I started. This is what I started to say earlier, until um, you know we realized I was talking about the wrong movie. But Rachel, <laughs> I I finally got her vision when I watched it this time, and I get what she was going for because this was the last movie. It was supposed to be the last movie, and until Wes Craven came back and gave us New Nightmare, it was. So, as far as we knew, this was it. This was the end. So. She did her best to bring something from every previous film, even to the point where um, there was uh, like a little bit of uh, the possession from part two. There was the, you know, the power to go into somebody else's dreams or bring people in. And I was like, when did we ever get to go? Or, and I was like, since when can you go or can she go into? And then I was like, oh, wait, 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 because you could. Uh, It just was in a previous film. And so she purposely pulled in influence from every film that came before. And then we got the Johnny Depp cameo. And then we got, you know, so this was like the definitive end of this franchise. And so they were purposely trying to tie everything up and make it make sense or bring it home. And I honestly, I give them credit for that now. And then they didn't even, you know, they bring in Alice Cooper as the foster dad and then, um, but they don't throw away the fact that Freddie was, you know, was born the way he was. And they don't necessarily delve into that in this one, but what they do is there is just a, a throwaway line pretty much that Alice Cooper says, but it makes everything make sense when he's just like, oh, you've been... Uh, I forget what he says, but like a pain in my ass or you've been nothing but trouble or whatever, ever since I took you in. 
So mm -hmm. even though, um, because at first I was like, how do you explain him having a father now? And then um, Brian was like, he's just his foster dad. And then he yeah. says that. And I was like, oh, yeah, OK, so they didn't fuck it up. Yeah. They didn't. They didn't. Yeah. They they kept it clean. They kept it true. And they just carried on with that. Now, there are a lot of things I don't like about this film, but there are a lot of things I do. And I I think it was very clever the way they used the 3D glasses where it gets um, muddy for me is at the end when uh, she like I can't tell if we're in like are we in a dream did she not wake up because there's that bit where, you know, she comes back and they're like, Oh, yay. But then Freddie's in their world. And I'm like, what the fuck just happened? How did he get there? And then I realize, Oh, she's, she must still be dreaming. You know, she thought she woke up, but she didn't. But then why are they there? And I would, but it, it's very confusing. That part's a little muddy for me, but, um, and it's a little too cartoony for my taste, like actual straight up cartoon. Yeah. Um, I really think it was fun, the idea to use the video games. And I actually like the beginning of it when it starts off as, you know, like a Mario game pretty much. And then he, but what I think brings that sequence down is when it turns more into a cartoon and they don't keep it true to being a video game. And I think they went too far with that. And if they had kept it more in line with uh, being an actual video game, I think that would have been much better. Uh, I always loved the crazy parents and the fact that there are no kids and these parents are just wandering around in this town um, and the crazy teacher in the school. I always loved those. Like that teacher in the school reminds me of Dr. Logan from Day of the Dead. Just he did Every time I, every time he talks, that's what I think of. Uh, mm. I don't know why. Maybe it was his oh, delivery. Wow. But, huh. um, yeah. I mean, and I don't really love the whole Wizard of Oz thing, but uh, conceptually, I like it. Like, I think that story-wise, it's a cool little intro. But the fact that Freddy is then the Wicked Witch—that's too far. Uh, so I think what it is is that. The, there are some really interesting ideas here, but they just went a little heavy handed with yeah. the jokiness of it. Um, and I even like the bed of spikes thing. Like that's actually my favorite kill in the movie. Is when he pushes the bed of spikes out there and it's silly and it's stupid. Mine too. Uh, yeah. The fact you had Roy's death from Friday five. What a shame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but yeah, I think really, and like I said before, this is the this is the epitome of me not uh, of me being brought down by the the Freddy parts versus the story parts because right. I actually okay. think the story is really cool and interesting, and the fact that you know in the future Springwood is uh, completely depleted of children, and this is their life now, and. Yeah. I think that's a my cool life concept. Now. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> wow, you quoted I Matt think that's a cool concept. Yep. It just, I wish they had taken it a little bit more seriously because there are some interesting things to explore here. And I don't feel like they, they explored them as much as I wanted them to. But, yeah. you know, I do see what she was trying to do as far as tying everything together because this is the last one. And I think that was pretty cool and successful. Yeah. And I think especially thinking about the time. There's a lot of Freddy in this one, but that makes sense. If they thought it was the last one, you have to go all out. And according, and based off of like the filmmaker's perspective, there's a lot of people that really liked jokey, f jokey Freddy. Those who are like really like That's good, true. scary movies. Yeah. Yes, they weren't a big fan of it, but as far as they're concerned, more audience members wanted that kind of Freddy at that time. So yeah. I think they were just trying to be loyal to the ultimate fan base and the ultimate fan base, at least in 1991, still won that comical Freddy. So it does make sense for why they would still be going down that route. Yeah. And especially they, you know, at that point, if they're ending the film, because, you know, they had other options, you know, the Peter Jackson uh, treatment and stuff, now which that, sounds amazing. I, I right? like that more. Yeah. But I, I yeah. think it was, it you know, in line with Christian and, um, and what Jamie said is by then they were just if they were wrapping it up, they were just going to try to make it more cohesive with the previous movies. And I, I, I do think, you know, that it, 
it, it makes sense. It makes sense why they continued it the way that they did for this one, because it was supposed to be the last one. So. Yeah. And as far as they were concerned, it was, I mean, they had that whole, you know, uh, with that, wasn't there like a full page ad that they put out or something with his, either his tombstone on it. They had a or funeral for him. A funeral. A funeral okay. Yeah. 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 Dude. Yeah. <clears throat> you know something? I want to go on the record and say, cause it's bothered me ever since the never sleep again. So the scene in the airplane, uh, when John is next to the, the old lady and she says, don't be a pussy. He says yep. that that role was supposed to be for divine, but she, she passed away. That is bullshit mm. because that movie was made in 1991. Divine died in 1988. And I see that coming in all the time that Divine is supposed to be. And no, she was, she was dead. <laughs> she was dead by the time part four came out. I don't know. She was Maybe dead they before didn't it know was that. a concept. Yeah, but they <laughs> yeah. didn't have this concept. There's no way they had this concept before exactly. she died. Exactly. Not by then. No, the yeah. fourth one was just coming out. Exactly. So it, it bothers me to know. And I know it doesn't have anything to do with the movie, but it, it just the information about the movie it bothers me. <laughs> Maybe the writer, who, whose idea was it? for Divine to be in it, the writer or the director or what? Well, there's Rich, uh, Rachel Talalay worked with John Waters in a lot of the movies. So, I mean, maybe it was a, oh. maybe an idea at one time, but I mean, that was like several years later. Well, I thought the dad from Home Alone was alive till last year. There you go. Yeah, maybe. That's yeah, I true. always do that. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe they didn't realize. Yeah, Although, I don't know. If she, if she I know Divine was, was dead. If she was that close to John Waters, no. she would have known, though. You know, like if right. Rachel right. knew John Waters, Waters that well, she would have known. So, that or maybe, yeah, maybe they said like a divine character, divine type character, and he, the, the actor just misconstrued it as actual divine. <laughs> oh, I'm supposed to be like God. <laughs> I'm divine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Weird how they exactly. left that edit in the documentary, though, because by they should have known that that fact yeah no fact checking jesus yeah how come they didn't go uh he doesn't know what he's talking about let's not put that in there right um (laughs) well john warder's crew worked on this movie they did yes yeah it was uh she was really into them and new line distributed a lot of his movies and then they made hairspray and all that other ones i uh as far as changing me on this one um see it's weird i i know this is crap for sure, I do feel like when I was watching, <laughs> when I was watching even the documentary to prep for this, they it's like everything they showed. It really did. I have to admit, it was kind of Freddy iconic. Like a, a lot of the imagery in this movie is really good. Um, it's just shot in, in an iconic way. Many scenes, and I thought it's almost like the same thing with like. You know how, like, when um, people think of certain horror villains and everything, they they think of an image that was, like, the fourth movie. It wasn't even how it really was. Like, like, well, like Frankenstein, like him putting his arms out. Oh, yeah. That wasn't until Lugosi did that because he played him as a blind character. Or the Igor thing. Igor, right. Everything about Frankenstein. All the ideas, and I've discovered it this summer watching them all, that all the ideas that I thought were going to be implemented in the earlier films. Yeah, no. Didn't come till much later. It's so weird. Oh, yeah. 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 Or even that he's called Frankenstein, like that's his name. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, now. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. right, right. And they even address that. Like, they go, they they call that bloody creation Frankenstein itself or whatever. Yeah. Like, they say it at one point. Yeah. Um, even back then in the 40s. Like, even think of Jason. Like, not till part three would, is he what everybody thinks of him as, you know? And, uh... Uh, M- Michael, I think some stuff he did in the later entries is what really people think of. Um, I was there's one I was thinking specific. I don't know why it's escaping me. Some like stalling with this, but either way. So like besides Freddy, because you're saying when you watch this movie, you think about mm-hmm. iconic. When you think about Freddy, you're I think you're getting at yeah. That you picture some scenes from this movie. I picture scenes from this movie, and and like. And it, it really, like, gave us our impression of who these people are. And I, I feel like with this movie, it, it, oddly enough, has a lot of that type of stuff going for it. So, yeah, you know, it's like what I was saying before, that even a lesser entry, there's still a lot of iconic moments in there that make up the franchise. Mm-hmm. So 
I always kind of had a thing for that. I wasn't going to exactly voice that on the retro. I'm not even sure I even felt that way at the moment. And by then, I was done with this. After part four and five, by now, I was just ready to trash. Um, so it is what it is. But, yeah, I, I I think I could watch this with people and just see what they think and go with it and kind of, like, just, I don't know. It's hard to say I'm ever going to, like, like this, no matter what discussion we kind of have for it. But Just one more thing I'll point out about the series on the whole is that I don't know of any other franchise – that continually touches on such harsh subjects mm. and they keep doing it in every, in every one of them, you know, these kids are going through real life shit. And uh, even in this one, you know, you've got the girl with the, you know, the pedo father. And I love that bit where she beats the shit out of him with that iron. Like that is just amazing the way she yeah. swings it. And I'm just, you can feel her fury and I'm right there with her. Uh-huh. And, but every single entry of this has kids going through real life, hard, dark shit. And then they're, and then, you know, Freddie on top of everything else, but he, he capitalizes on their real life pain. And I, I don't know of any other horror franchise that, that explores those subjects so deeply and so consistently. Yeah. It, it's like, if you take some of these sequels at such face value, of course you're not going to really like it. But when you really look at some of the deeper themes and some of the deeper ideas they're trying to portray within such a cheesy face value slasher, it really does give it the substance that so many other horror franchises, especially at that time, were not really doing. Yeah, and and now discount Jodie Foster has a pet. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, that is... That... <laughs> That is so wild to me. Every time I watch that, it's always like, "Oh, oh yeah, right." I just watched it today. It's it's so bizarre, and it's never explained. <laughs> no. no, 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 it's not even brought up. It's just here. You know, here's this. <laughs> she just yeah. pet, pets it and feeds it and doesn't say a word about it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, and I think what I think what happened upon my viewing here is that I realized that what I thought previously were simply on the surface throwaway sequels just to bring Freddy back. I think what I realized is there actually is more depth there than I don't I don't think they ever have the depth of a Wes Craven film because that's just who he is. I mean, he is just a um he's a very scholarly guy, you know. He's so, an English professor. So. so exactly. So he infuses Uh, His, you know, his knowledge and his interest in other things into all of his films. And I think that shows. So we don't get that uh, that level, but they still keep they keep approaching serious subjects and they do it kind of flippantly at times. But they're still there. And I, you know, I do respect that. Yeah, no, definitely um, give this movie another look. <clears throat> along with part five and see what you think after all this discussion um yeah i think it's hard to, for any of us to say right now if we're just flip-flopping here but well the thing about this movie is I, i'll say this in my in my travels every time i talk to a, a nightmare on elm street uh you know franchise fanboy they always have this as their worst and for some reason even though i'm not going to sit here and say it's good i've always felt a defensive towards it as a matter of fact and I may have mentioned this last time we did it, but uh, the only movies that I owned on DVD for the longest time were one, two, three, and this one. Didn't have four and five, but for some reason, the I, I used to have like a a respect for it. And the respect I had is that four and five angered me so much because they were trying to do horror but making it goofy that I've always said that by the time this came around, They just figured out that this wasn't a horror at all anymore, and they were just going to – instead of masquerading themselves as a horror movie, they have freaking, you know, Freddy with one-liners and all that. This movie, they're just going to go balls out with a comedy and say, okay, this is where we're at. We're not going to insult anybody by trying to freaking say this is a horror movie. It's not a horror movie at all. It's it's ridiculous comedy, Freddy at at his worst, and everything else at their worst. Now, the set design is good. There, There are some cool things here. So, and I really enjoy, and I'm always a sucker for 
when you see Freddy as a human and the stuff with Alice Cooper and all that other stuff. I've always quite liked that. I know people think the dream demons are cheesy, but hell, no more cheesy than so many other things we've seen in this franchise that I question. It's just, did it have to be so, you know, visual with him saying, yes, I want it all. I mean, yes, they took I it too far, it but... All. Oh. <laughs> but they take everything too far here the whole time. And I actually also like the swerve we get in thinking that, okay, uh-uh, and he's cutting from the parachute. We think that one person's the kid, and we find out it's not, because at the time, I'm thinking... I don't know if everybody else thought it. I, I, at the time, I wasn't thinking that they're they're telegraphing this just to give you the swerve. I was like, okay, this person here is obviously Freddy's child. This is interesting. And then they do that. Uh, so I, th- I always liked that. I love the Carlos sequence. I think it's one of the best. Just just the way I like the comic book. I like love the Carlos five. sequence. That's the best in this movie. It's cool. It's cool. Now, I don't like comedy Freddy, but I like the fact that they embrace it here. And I don't know if that makes sense, but I also think that the, the the Nightmare fanboys hate it so much, and I always felt like defending it just a little bit, that I'm like, how come, how could you hate part six, but like part four and five with that ridiculous comedy? At least this one's doing something different, and they're getting away those characters. We have new characters coming in, almost like when we first meet the people in Dream Warriors. We don't, I mean, besides Nancy, of course, but we're getting new people coming in. In, I think, what are they at, like a halfway house or something in this one? They're they're at something, right? They're together at first? Yeah, yeah. It's okay. a shelter. That, well, the cops refer to it as a shelter. Okay, see, I like that because it's more of a standalone movie. And how many times, not just me, but people always say what you need with these franchise movies is just take the antagonist and put them in a, in, in a standalone movie. We don't have to have all this continuation. Let's just have Michael and Haddonfield killing people, Jason and Crystal Lake hacking people up in the the woods, and let's put Freddy just invading some other kids' dreams with no other explanation. Now, that's not what I'm saying we get here, but I like that we pivoted from four and five and went here. I still don't like it anymore, but I do appreciate some of the things that (laughs) <laughs> well said. That are, that are being said here. Thank you. And, and really, Jamie said a lot of interesting things about, you know, the topics going on here, everything else. If they toned down the comedy a little and like the last four and five were, then yeah. But I just think they just embraced everything at the time. This does look a little cheaper, I'll say. Like the sets sometimes, some are done well. But some of the other stuff, like in the end when they bring them out in the real world, after you put the glasses on and it's supposed to go in 3D – I always kind of fall out a little bit in that, in, in those moments, and that's when you're supposed to be the most invested, I think. But something about it just doesn't doesn't look right. It just looks cheap or something. But I don't hate the movie. Don't necessarily like it, but so you know, I think I'll watch it again. Same thing. I think in the near future, I'm going to watch you know four or five and six again. Is what it comes down to. Well, one thing I still haven't come around on and I cannot defend is the dream demons. To me, that is the equivalent <laughs> of that fucking thing in Jason Goes to Hell. And I <sighs> I don't like it at all. Like, I don't. I mean, what is wrong with this guy just supernaturally coming back to get revenge because he was killed by some parents for what he did? Like, I, I, I just keep it simple. Keep it simple. Yes. Don't try to bring in this whole ancient thing that is just not necessary. And by the way, looks terrible. So uh, even yeah. by those, even by those days standards, it looked terrible and it was goofy. And I just, I don't need that. I don't need this deeper lore, just like the Thorn trilogy. I don't need that. Like, stop it. Just stop it. Sometimes people are just evil. Mm-hmm. I agree, but I think because this is the last one, and they're they're trying to make it the last one and put in you know put a bow on it, they want to explore those things and say, hey, if you have any unanswered questions about Freddy Krueger, this is the movie where you're gonna find it out. I I right. think that's why they went there, you know. And at least it's not. I don't agree with it, but at least it's not the whole ninety minutes they talked about that. No, too. that's it's true. like that that's is true. the movie. It is it is it's one of those things where if you really hate that part, it's only there for a couple minutes, and then you move on. So. Not enough to fully affect a viewing. That's true, uh, 100%. And I actually uh, tend to forget about it. 
<laughs> and then when I watch it, I'm like, oh, right, damn. Oh, like Cult of Thorn was just in your face the whole time. Oh, the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I I actually have always um, been okay with all of the background stories of Freddy, like from three and on. Well, I know you love Alice Cooper, so that has to be a highlight for this film at <laughs> right. least. Thank you, sir. May I have another? Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, that's that yeah, he's my favorite musical artist of all time. So that's definitely a huge highlight. And he's covered two he's been in two films, uh, technically. Right? Yeah. Jason and Jason and uh <laughs> yeah, Freddy. Surprised you never And Monster Dog. <laughs> yeah. In Prince of Darkness. <laughs> now that no, that's a that's one I, I definitely uh that's cool when he shoves the thing through the guy's body. Yeah, that that's a cool moment. Um, Monster Dog, I tried to, I tried that. I just can't. I just went back to the music. So bad it's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, wow. So I guess we got one more to go to finish this off. Our uh, revisiting of our Nightmare on Elm Street retrospective. And I'm so glad we did this now. I really thought this would go down differently this has become a show even I couldn't have imagined. This is a great kind of dipping our toe back into this whole thing kind of uh, show. I mean, the only thing we really did, um, me and Jamie talked earlier, was really our 10th anniversary special, which was over a year ago. It was like a year and, and uh, three months ago. I can't believe that's how long it's been since we did something. <clears throat> and then... Um, I released that Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead thing, but that was an unofficial review we did for something else that I just kind of <laughs> distributed to the Skeleton Crew audience because uh, we're all on it, and it's sort of scary, sort of, in a way. Um, and then uh, and then this. And I guess the only thing before that was like two months before the anniversary was the Texas Chainsaw when me, Dave, and Jamie got together. So I this is our first real kind of big thing we're doing uh content wise and god well you guys have been great uh jamie is on fire dave has spitting fire i mean i'm i'm clearly the weakest link here and and i'm okay with that because <laughs> you guys are all like firing on all cylinders and that's amazing and i just love this i'm like i feel like a listener right now there's a there's a few moments where I forgot to speak because I just thought I was listening to the skeleton crew <laughs> that I remember that was like oh crap I'm on it like oh, what, oh oh who me <laughs> yeah um no yeah no that's how I feel right now but I'm okay with that I'm I'm taking a back seat deliberately because I I haven't come to these realizations for any of these movies Jamie is on a new journey and you guys always been on your journey <laughs> and 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 Dave has his more recent journey with these movies it's been eight years for me honestly so. I'm just taking it in. So uh, let's just uh, let's finish it out with uh, Wes Craven's New Nightmare. So this is supposed to be sort of in the same vein as Scream in a way where it's like meta, where where we know it's a movie and it's that, that's observed. And I know and, and we're the characters. I only played these parts and, and all this stuff. And <clears throat> this is like one of the first times like this type this specific avenue of the genre went to like the smart route and stuff like that so um dave feels this movie masquerades itself as a smart movie but it's really not it's just as dumb as everything else and i feel like we definitely <clears throat> picked it apart and i totally agree with that sentiment and jamie <clears throat> i don't think we convinced her it's not as because you're that's bullshit you're not you're going wrong. to <laughs> right i think <laughs> she just thought we were wrong um yeah well you are <laughs> and she's right so good <laughs> oh so you, you all agree okay yeah oh okay well then i just ask you to tell us what notes you got listening to our retro and how me and dave are wrong that is what we're trying to find out here because i think we still think we're right <laughs> Well, the things I did like from the retro is there was a lot more love for Heather Langenkamp. Right. Yes. Which is nice. I think she just progressed as an actress. Yeah. Anyway, I think she was, you know, she was better in Dream Warriors, Warriors and she was uh, even better here. And it's definitely her story, which I love. Like I said, I love a protagonist that takes up more screen time than the villain. You get to know more of that backstory. 
Um, I watched this movie, ironically enough, with my mother like six months ago. Hmm. And she did not want to watch it at all. <laughs> <laughs> She's not into these kinds of movies, horror films slash movies. She's, it's just not her thing. And then after we finished watching this one, she she did know the original Nightmare on Elm Street. She's seen that one. So she knew enough of the concepts and the references. And I asked her what she thought. And she was like, you know what? I actually liked it. Hmm. Yay! She did. And I think it's because she's a mother of sons. And so it was a story about a mother protecting the son. And I think this is one of those movies where it's more about the deeper meanings than what you're getting at face value again. Because it deals with so many topics about, especially her as an actress, like how does this whole Freddy fandom impact her life and the life of her child? How is this affecting the lives of other people behind the scenes? It's to the point where it's all about the fans, and the fans have officially taken over the franchise because Freddy just won't go away. And it being the 10th anniversary, there's a lot of uh, fan service in there too. I love the fact that Freddy is a little different in this one. And yes, there's not many kills in it per se, but it's not really about the kills. It's not really about, it's not meant to really be a slasher movie. It's meant to be more about how people, these actors and all these filmmakers are dealing with the impact this nightmare franchise has made on their lives and their careers. So I think just in terms of the commentary it is really smart and so yes there could be scenes that you know you may be reaching to find uh what makes certain rules make sense versus what doesn't it's kind of hard considering it is its own concept and it doesn't necessarily have to follow the exact same rules as the movies because it's like whenever we do have a nightmare Wes even says that freddy is this Freddy is based off the of dreams he's had. Well, there are a lot of times when I wake up from a dream and it's very hazy in terms of the exact details of how everything works anyway. And so it's interesting concept to think, you know what? This demonic figure wants to be Freddy and is essentially Freddy, but the rules of the films don't necessarily have to apply. Wes Craven has dreams of Freddy, and so his concept of the movie is about people having dreams of Freddy. But does that necessarily mean that this this Freddy always has to just get you in the dreams? Or is this demonic Freddy to be a part of people's everyday uh, scares as well? Does it have to be a dream with this one? And so it just explores so many different topics and so many questions are left unanswered. But I think that's the point is we don't exactly know what this real life figure is. You know, what happened was last time I watched this movie, I was able to figure out a few things with the uh, – I was kind of like – it kind of went over my head, I think, in some respects, where I had to do a little more uh, analyzing to to understand exactly what was happening with Wes Craven when he was writing because what I used to think was – it was awfully silly for it to end the way it did, which is like, well, if he's controlling the whole thing, how does any of this make sense? That was my beef at the, the way it ended. I was like, well, this doesn't, that's just stupid. You know, I'm not going to change my stance on what happens in the, uh, in the final act. I think the final act just goes to, it's just throwing shit up against the wall and, and seeing what sticks kind of like four and five and six were doing just like, that's what I meant about it, where it went down that same silly type path. But of course, you have to respect the uh, you know the whole meta approach and what and what was happening here. And it, it was different. It was cool. And then hearing about a boogeyman, you know that 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 really exists, and it, it comes out with it's that that part is clever. I just couldn't figure it. out. I couldn't wrap my head around it in the past. And the last time I watched it, I did. It doesn't excuse other things in the movie that that I discussed, and you know, again with just just things that don't add up. Uh, it doesn't. I I don't think it's as strong as it could be. I think there's just it just there was some mistakes made, but I do I no longer have a problem with you know what the, the the thing is here with Wes Craven and, and, and getting it out and this thing really existed. I have a better understanding of that now. So that does help. 
but I'm not, but I, but it doesn't it doesn't mean that I think the movie's great now because I still have all the same issues I had last time, and no one's ever been able to fix them for me. But I fixed it on my own with you know being able to figure out what was going on here. So that's really all I can say. The other stuff that I, I've always had a problem with, I don't think there is fixing it. It's just stuff that doesn't you know doesn't make sense. Period. And that's the problem because that was the problem with four, five, and six that things weren't making any sense. And this movie's coming out, coming off like it's a more intelligent approach. And it is to a degree with some of it, but a lot of the other stuff just falls into the same, the same trap that everything after part three falls into. That I think that's what I was mostly getting at when I said in the past that it masqueraded itself at being clever. So, uh, well, I think. Well, and I've always loved this one, like, hands down. It's it's my top three. But um, I think next time, next time you find yourself watching this film, mm-hmm. pay attention to specifically Wes Craven and the things he says, and then kind of see if you can marry that with what's going on. Because to me, this is a statement by Craven about what they did to his character. Oh, the fact that he, cool. you know, they bring Freddie out to the audience and he's all goofy as shit. And then Wes says, you know, this one is darker, meaner. You know, it's they drive that point home several times. And I think this is the equivalent of when George Romero says zombies can't run, they'd break their ankles. So <laughs> I think mm. it's. I think this whole thing is Wes Craven's perspective on what happened to the character he created. And he created that character to be dark and mean spirited. And then it morphed into something that he did not want. And then he was bringing it back around to what he should be. And I think that I think that's the whole thing. I think that's what he was saying the whole time. I think that's great, but then why didn't he execute it that way in the third act when it got silly and he was stabbing his tongue? And and then the kid's crossing the street and you see all these other Freddies all over the place. I'm like, you're doing the same things that you did before. If you want to make it darker and serious, make it more like the first one then. Well, the tongue thing, I do. Uh, The tongue thing, though, was always always in Craven's. I mean, in the very first film, his tongue came into play. Now, this time it was a little silly because it wrapped all around her. And then I always get pissed off at the kid because he's cutting it at the wrong place. And I'm like, (laughs) why are you why are you stabbing the end of it? Go to the end that's before it wrapped around your mother's neck. You know, but he don't want to be two inches away from space. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But I love the Hansel and Gretel Uh, imagery and if you look here's another thing too that's very cool if you pay attention to the fairy tale book that she's reading from when she's reading him the story of hansel and gretel and look at the picture of the witch in the oven at the end of that story and then look at the painting that robert england is painting when she goes to visit him the styles are dead on that was obviously on purpose and i think it's cool you know i yeah, I love all of that. That was my take on it, though. I don't know. Do you guys see, uh, like, um, Christian and Zach, do you guys see the whole Wes Craven thing, or do you think I'm making that shit up? No, I I agree. I I love the whole... I mean, it, it really is a film about, about the industry and the fact that, yeah, I mean, Wes Craven has never been quiet about where they've taken Freddy and... You know, and there's a lot of hard feelings over the years and stuff. So, I mean, he, it really, it, uh, to me, that's how I took it, too, is that it's better than the Dream Demons in the first movie, you know, in the last movie. But it's it's basically his commentary on also just how how popular Freddy got and how, yeah, how desensitized he became or, you know, or sensitized. I don't know. What would you call it? Deluded, I guess. You know, how deluded he became as time went on and I also I also like the point of view not only from Wes Craven but Heather Heather Langenkamp also you know trying being a mother and yet this movie still encompasses her life you know no matter what she tries to do to to break that it's it's always about oh well you did a horror movie 10 years ago and 
you know, this is why your son's fucked up or, you know, and it, she's in the limo and the guy's talking about the movie that she made. And, she, you know, it's it's interesting how it, it it's I think it's a really good commentary on 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 the actors and and about filmmaking and about fandom like crazy fandom i also what i loved about this movie at the time it wasn't as common it was really cool to see her going to new line cinema studio yeah and like to see yeah. all that like hollywood background stuff that now you see it all the time i feel like but i i loved all of that because it, it it felt real it felt like it, to me this i don't even put this with the other nightmare movies you know and at the time in 1994 it was it, it wasn't popular to have a slasher film anymore. And so it really was more psychological in, in its, you know, execution. And, and I think that's, I think that was a great way to go and to separate it from Freddy's dead and the previous movies. Um, I, I just, I found it to be a really fresh concept and a really cool, unusual idea that, I don't know. We just don't see movies like this anymore. It feels like things, everything has just been done at this point, or it's just all about rehashes. And so I, I, I appreciate the the freshness of this movie. And sometimes, yeah, it doesn't always work. Um, but I appreciate the execution. I, I love seeing Wes Craven back and you really could watch the first one. And then this one as sort of maybe polar opposites in some ways. And, but also see how they're related. So yeah, I think I think it's a great film. I I love that Freddie is more darker and more sinister in this one, and I think that was well executed. One thing I also love is considering that the ones that come after this is just Freddie versus Jason, which is just more of a fun crossover, and then the remake. This feels like such a fun, fitting conclusion to the franchise of like the original Nightmare films because everything just comes full circle. Um, with Heather and then even the concept of her having the pajamas again and then watching the original on the TV screens. There's just so much. I love full circle moments like that. Yeah. And instead of it just being a Nancy follow-up to end the franchise, it was cool enough to recognize the continuity that Nancy is dead and have it be her and have the finale be a commentary on the franchise itself. Like that's such a cool way to sort of, end it all and Wes Craven really was just trying to like tie the bows in between I also love the fact that unlike the other nightmare movies this movie at its core is actually about a parent who does care about the child and is trying to do what's best for the child because we've seen in all the other movies and we've talked about it how it's really messed up what these kids have gone through especially with parents that weren't trying to help them and so I love that this movie is literally the opposite approach it is about it's about the parent, not the kid, trying to do what's best to save them. And I remember one thing in the retro that you guys were touching upon since I mentioned Nancy's dead is how could Nancy, how could she be playing Nancy? Nancy's dead. Well, I don't think this demonic Freddy really cares that much about the continuity of the film since this isn't a movie. I think of it as like a sadistic role play because when in that final act, she is Heather Langenkamp playing Nancy, not is Nancy. And so sometimes there's this whole idea of like, but Nancy died in Dream Warriors. And I remember you mentioned the retro and I'm like, no, she's Heather Langenkamp meant to portray and pretend that she's Nancy since she is the one who did give Nancy the strength in that first one. She's the one who did portray her and portrayed that strength. And so this demonic Freddy wants to play a sadistic game as if she was Nancy and calling her Nancy in order to do what he has to do. He just really likes the game, what happened in the movies, and use some of the best parts of that first movie, and then sometimes ignoring the concepts of the movies. And so, I don't know, I just think this Freddy is a metaphor for the fandom in a lot of ways, because if this Freddy wants certain things that came before and prefers concepts from the first one and tries to ignore a lot of the things that came after it. I don't know, it's just so much fun. You know what? I remember what I didn't like about it. And maybe you guys can straighten me out. There was right. something else that happened involving this. No, the Nancy stuff actually works. I get that. But I remember this one particular part where two people, want John Saxon and somebody else go to the house. There's a conversation going on. And for some reason, the guy says something. Is Why did you call me John? Like for no reason, John Saxon all of a sudden thinks that he's Nancy's father. How did any of that part make sense? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? 
Yeah. I love that bit when. He, How does it make sense? I love it too. He's he is John Saxon, but then all of a sudden he's her father and she's Nancy. But why would he think that? This has nothing to do with John Saxon. Why would John Saxon think that freaking he was the father? That has nothing to do with anything else in this plot. I think that's her perception. I think that. So you don't think that happened that conversation when he said, "Why are you calling me, John?" Yeah, you know I what I'm saying. That, no, I do, I do. Okay. But I think that that is intended to be her perception of the situation, like her point of view. She's being fucked with, you know. Yeah. And uh, I think that's pretty much all that is. And I actually, I really love that. Yeah, sequence. it's more like a projection. <laughs> like this, this Freddy is messing with her and wants to redo things from the first one. Well, there was no one around to see him. It could easily be in her head with this Freddy messing with her. Well, was, what was, was the established? When she's like, dad, or whatever it was she said, and then said, daddy, you know. Yeah, maybe I she got confused. Like, maybe it went over my head where it was like they were explaining it and I couldn't attach myself to what they were going with. But just from my eyes watching that and from my memory, I remember that being really stupid. I'm like, why would he? What does John Saxon, the actor – have to do with what Heather Langenkamp is going through. And that was it. I was like, well, wait a minute. They didn't explain him having anything to do with this. How come all of a sudden he doesn't know who he is? He thinks he's a character in a movie now? That's what I didn't get. But yeah, if you no, guys I are don't, saying no, I don't think he actually thinks that. I think that yeah. uh, that's just her being fucked with by Freddie. And then they do also mention, and they don't, and you're right, they don't bring him into it. They don't mention that he's having nightmares, but Bob Shea is having nightmares, Robert England is having nightmares, and Wes Craven is having nightmares. So right. all of those people that would be involved with the new one that they're trying to make, they are being affected by it. And, but not him. So I think that that is from her point of view. And yes, projection. I think it's it's being projected. And she it is a mind trick f specifically for Heather. Yeah. And uh, that's how I look at it anyway. Yeah. And that's, how, that's why Heather she responds in kind. Yeah. I also like the fact that she's married to, in this film, she's married to a special effects artist, which she has been since 1991, I think, yeah. is the year. I, and uh, IRL. That, IRL in real life. Yeah. Um, and right. I love that. That's a nice way to mirror her real life. I like the fact that they bring in the concept of a stalker, uh, which yes. to my knowledge, I don't know if Heather or if, yeah, yes. if Heather ever went through that. I she said that she did. I don't think it was to the yeah. same extent as like Alice in Friday the 13th, but she was okay. getting some okay. threats. Yeah, that, so that's what I wanted to touch on, too, with the just the 10 of us, because Wes Craven had mentioned she was getting calls, not because of the Freddy movies, but because of the just the 10 of us, this bland oh. TV show. Yeah. And so Someone yeah, definitely preferred growing pains. Exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> but uh but yeah, I, I as far as it being uh, just it's a yeah, it's a commentary on the industry and on the direction that the films took and how it affected all their lives in real life and how, uh, you know, the bit where she's in the limo, how uh, celebrities get sick of having the same characters thrown in their face over and over and over again. It's like, look, bitch, I did other things. And uh, like Robert England, you know, everyone knows him as Freddie and everyone's going to talk to him about uh, Freddie, but he was a great character in V. He, you know, I mean, he did a lot of other things and he's classically trained <laughs> and a really good actor, but everyone wants to tie him to this slasher villain, which is great. I mean, you know, Freddy on the whole is a great villain and he did a wonderful job, but don't you think you'd get sick of that? You know, if uh, people were throwing the same thing in your face all the time, it's like, can we talk about something else I've done? Yeah, can we talk about Hatchet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, okay, well, that's kind of like bringing up, you know, Piranha, Piranha 3D to uh, Richard Dreyfuss. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love that. I love how real it feels and how when she goes to the studio, that feels so real. And it was, I believe it was actually filmed at New Line. So I think that is real. The woman that came out to greet her is a real life woman that works at... Um, that works at New Line. Like, it's, I think. A real life woman. <laughs> a real life woman. Yeah, but she, is, she played herself. I mean, that's what Sarah I mean. Richard. <laughs> yeah. um, they didn't make her up. Uh, so she, um, <laughs> uh, no, they, 
<laughs> blended real life and fantasy, I think, beautifully. And sometimes the lines are blurred, but I think that's what makes it stronger is that on her, it would be harder because how do I know what's real and what's not? And then you've got that fucking doctor. I just want to punch her in the face. Um, <laughs> I do love that That's scene right. where she's like, you got to cut the evil out. You know, I, I love that. But the doctor and herself and those nurses. <laughs> um, and oh, the, see. The babysitter. I love her. I know. Yeah. She was a good character. And she had the best or one of the few deaths of the movie. That, yeah. that hurt me. I love her. That, that really hurt me because Thank I you. loved her character i it hurt me when chase got because i loved his character you know so once again um, you're dealing with loss because it was someone close to heather and throughout the rest of the movie it's her dealing with that being a single yeah. mom there's a lot again of character growth and how people are handling the situations that they're in why is the kid seeing it then if this is in nancy's head and then people how come the kid is seeing it when he's in the hospital all of a sudden and it completely goes against the rules because nobody was sleeping all because of a sudden there are no rules because this isn't a movie this is real but life. In, yeah but right but in the rest of the film it, it all has to do with them going to sleep correct just that one scene it, it doesn't unless i'm wrong i'm not saying i'm 100 percent right i'm just questioning by memory that, that well was i it. think uh, well i always thought that this demonic freddy like the point is wes craven came up with the idea of a nightmare on Elm street based off of his nightmares but he created his own rules in the script on how it works we don't know that this freddy only gets people in their dreams maybe sometimes he uses the concept because he liked the concept from the movie but who says that this demonic figure couldn't get people in the real world regardless of if they're awake or asleep they don't establish anything to the point where it feels like it's completely against anything that came before because this isn't the same. This isn't the movies. This is its own entity. Yeah, and this is the real, the real world Freddy. And I love his costume in this. I, I absolutely adore the green fedora and the, the long jacket and the, you know, even the leather pants. Fuck yes, I like that shit. Mm -hmm. um, I think he looks cool. He looks stylized. The only thing I don't like about his look is I think his face looks too dry. It looks like part five. Other than yeah, that. He could be in the shadows more, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I, I love his eyes. I love everything about his just. You know what's cool about his glove? That That's the glove you see in the part one poster. Yeah, true. that's right. Yeah. Oh, true. yeah. That's true. It's crazy. Yeah. Wow. Oh, and I love the opening. It's in a lot of the other posters, too, I think. Yeah, even part two, right? Yeah. When they're looking in the mirror. Yeah. Yeah. That opening dream that Heather's having right before the earthquake when she dreams that she's making a movie with Wes Craven and like Wes Craven is actually there on the set and then they're they're doing the whole glove thing. She has no idea that Bob Shea has been planning this behind her back the whole time with Wes Craven, this new movie. But yet she has a dream about that and then all of that shit actually happens. Like I don't I I think that's just fantastic and yeah what's what's really cool about that too is because if you're watching it for the first time you don't notice but it's like all of that's in the final act you know you see it, in the background yes. they're in the final act and that's that was really cool mm -hmm. yeah i mean i i just feel like this film has a lot of depth and mm -hmm. uh has a lot to say and i don't think it's him trying too hard i think it's him just putting out his feelings on the whole situation. And I, I think he did it brilliantly. Wow. Well, you convinced me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah that, I'm like sitting here processing all this stuff and I'm going, boy, I did not take any of that in when I watched it for the retro. You know what I think though? I think when we do retros, you got to remember like it's, it's a job for sure. Yeah. Like you got to sit through in a case like this, eight movies in a pretty short amount of time for sure. Process a lot, and then you're taking notes for maybe one point of view or whatever, or you're trying to do things how you do them sometimes instead of how they should be done for here. So I think that you know a lot of those factors come into how what approach you take when you review a movie, especially in a retrospective and things like that, especially when it's 
deep into it, especially when it's you haven't been having a good time so far uh, since the early episodes or whatever. And I think I think a lot of that comes into it, and it it, it creates a, like a frustration or something in a way where you begin to lash out at anything that's wrong now, you know. And uh, you you could definitely like miss a lot of the positive points to something, and you could kind of gloss over them to get to the things that are wrong. And I think I think I'm probably definitely a victim of that. Well, plus the things that are wrong are funnier. That too, you know. And yeah. that was, yeah. and we have always, uh, we've always said that the number one thing we try to do is just be entertaining. And so we point out that stuff because it's funny to, you know, to point it out, at least to us. But <laughs> well, hopefully to everybody listening. <laughs> apparently we almost lost these guys. So I'm <laughs> yeah, we got to rethink this approach. <laughs> I'm glad, I'm glad you both came back. But... We're living proof. <laughs> yeah. Recovery is always possible. Yeah, it maybe it was funny or entertaining even to them because they came back. They didn't have to. They they could have said, well, they did that to our favorite movies, but that was pretty entertaining. So I'll give them another shot with something else. You know, Christian had to take a break. <laughs> right, just, just, a, just a brief one. <laughs> just a brief one. A break too. What made you continue on with our show as opposed to like the other eight hundred podcasts that you could have just moved on to? Because you guys are just way more entertaining to listen to. Oh well, there you go, Jamie. See, it worked. <laughs> you really are. You're, yeah, so, you're all thank you. I won't let idea. a few shows out of a couple hundred that you do, you know, affect it. Thank you. Yeah, See, charismatic, well-spoken, yeah. articulate. You know, you guys are great. Thanks. Thank you. See, that's the idea. That's the uh, every time somebody starts a, a podcast, right? And and, and uh, they become a new podcaster, and they ask me anything. I owe it. Not that I'm an expert. I'm saying this is what I do. Oh, you are now, buddy. Well, I, I say this. I say, rem- be be yourself, but. Make sure that you remember at all times that there's an audience listening. You have to try to be entertaining. Any two jerk-offs can sit and have a conversation. Anybody. But you have to implement some degree of entertainment in there to separate you from someone else. And if you're not intelligent enough to actually be able to pick everything apart, and who wants to be serious all the time? Nobody, really. Right. And who wants to listen to that? Nobody. Just no matter what you do, keep in mind there's an audience listening. It isn't just you having a conversation with someone. You have to keep that in there. And and the thing, what I always try to do personally, me, I'm not speaking for everybody else, but I'm saying if I don't like something or if I do like something, I'm always going to tell you why. I'm always going to give you my reasons, and either you could say, hey, check this out. Well, th- think about it from this perspective. Maybe what you said there isn't right, and I'll analyze it. But always give reasons, man, and that's what I think we we do here is we always – we're not just going to say, well, this is a piece of shit, Freddie, too much comedy, bluck. We're not just going to say that. We're going to get into the, the details of it, and we're going to remember to attempt – to be entertaining. So I guess that's that's one thing about us. Right. And it will be really boring if we all liked the same things and hated the same things anyway. So yeah, it's cool. To, it's, that's what art is. So right. Exactly and it's art. it's other, great that you guys uh, tore it down so much because then otherwise we wouldn't be on here right now. Yeah. yeah. See? <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. True. Yeah, it's important to, I think, remember that people are out there. And sometimes I forget myself. And it's not like I forget that um, that there's anybody listening, but I forget how many people are out there because you have those listeners that are constantly engaging with you, that send you messages about every episode, that uh, make comments on the Facebook page about something you said on the episode. And they're there. They're always there. And I sometimes forget that there are a lot of other people out there who have never said a word. And mm-hmm. <laughs> and then I'll feel like I have a very intimate setting and I'm just talking to a few people and then it'll hit me and it kind of freaks me out when it hits me that, oh no, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> there are people huh. out there that you don't even know are listening and have been listening for sometimes at this point, like 15 years, you know, yeah. and it's 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 weird but yeah, people pay attention more than you realize yeah now yeah. that that just freaked me out even more thank you yeah, <laughs> oh, sorry. yeah let's compound this 
I also wanted to say, Jamie, if you forgot who you are, just make sure you have a name tag, you know, so right. you, you can look down. <laughs> I'll look down. Like, oh, right. I'm Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I forgot. What did the script say? Uh, oh, Amanda. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, th- guys, thanks so much. I mean, this, like I said, turned out way better than I ever, ever could have expected. You guys are great on, on the on the show. Um, I know Christian has a lot of experience. Uh, Zach, I don't know. Have you been on a lot of shows guesting or anything? I've been on the Slumber Party Massacre. Uh, right. Three episodes. Mm. So. Yeah, like three times now, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I, I've heard I've heard them all. Times. I've heard all your guys. Yeah, yep. and then I was on Catch the Chase, I think, yep. ten times. Oh uh-huh. yeah, a lot of scream stuff there. <laughs> so we're on your spin off. <laughs> a lot. We're on your spin off. <laughs> uh... <laughs> I've had some. What is it? I've had some. What does Nancy say? Where she says she's had. Ex- oh, I've had some experience with with pattern nightmares. Podcast. Yeah, there we go. Sorry. <laughs> Feel free to edit that. Nice. You both sound like naturals to me. So uh, I think you definitely did the concept of this show justice. Um, I'm glad Jamie had that new journey. <laughs> I'm sorry, Alex. <laughs> I know that threw a wrench in, into your plans, but I wasn't expecting it either. I she made our job so much easier. She's so articulate. It really it's like, oh, thank you. <laughs> you. Jamie had more journey than Nancy or Alice or any of <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the character growth. Come on now. The ca- more character growth than all of them. No, I'm good with it. I'm not looking to spread hate, hate, hate or anything. I'm just, I just thought it'd be different. That's all. But no, it actually turned out fine. Um, so thanks again, guys. And uh, it's, it's great to uh, kind of wrap up the summer with this uh, the same way we did it eight years ago, which is hard to believe. Um, we were all eight years younger. God, you know, it's hard to wrap your head around something like that. Yeah, especially since now I'm 25 years younger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Dave was like 40 back then, and, and he's he's 40 now, so that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, Dave, uh, tell the folks something about yourself. Well, there's not a whole lot to tell. I, uh, I've been a big-time horror movie viewer since the 80s. I'm uh, 40 years old. I've been watching a lot of horror movies since the 80s, since I was old enough to rent them. There's not a whole lot to tell. I'm a pretty simple guy. Good, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like I said, I was a freshman in high school when that, those shows came out. Now I teach there, so it's been a lot. You're like Wes Craven. Yeah. Hope everybody enjoyed this and uh, enjoyed the growth of this show uh, in our absence. We'll look to uh, crank out a few more uh, episodes uh, for the rest of summer into fall towards Halloween. We'll try to cook some stuff up. I know Dave has a couple of ideas he's looking to throw around with people. So we're going to get to that next. But I hope you enjoyed. And again, Zach, Christian, thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Hit the showers, (laughs) dirtballs. I, I, I'm trying to... with power. <laughs> In my dreams, I'm beautiful and bad. <laughs> I'm your boyfriend now, Nancy. Have a nice stroll, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Perfect exit. <laughs>